ready to get started? Okay, is it recording? Yes. Okay, I don't know what's happening. Okay, there we go. Okay. Yay. Hello. All right, take hey. two. All right. Hey, oh. first of all, um, this is a re-recording of a recording that we did. Uh, we want to thank y'all for participating and helping us with the playground. And so as an added bonus for doing that, being offered her back of the envelope <laughs> spreadsheet, which is way, 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 which is worth way more than its weight uh, in gold. Okay. Okay, let's talk about it. I like it. Okay. And just so you guys know, we're also doing this live. So oh, yeah. there's going to be some, there be some questions. interesting interaction happening, but we're going to go through it. Okay, so this is going to be underwriting, basically. So this is how we look at deals very quickly and decide, do we want to even pursue further investigation into it? So this is what we use before we walk the property, before we call comps, like all of that stuff. We're just trying to get like a really quick high level analysis. And ultimately, when you end up finishing this, it should be like 20 to 30 minutes, which... I know you guys are going to be overwhelmed when you first look at it because you're like, I can't do that in 20 minutes, but it gets easier once Absolutely. you get familiar with it. Um, and everybody here is, except Robert, but Robert's a creator, so he's going to catch on. Uh, Siobhan and her sister both handle real estate and management, mm. GCs, uh, issues and finance. So this will be. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But um, you guys look at, I mean, this is meant to be easy. easy right. Um, so we we start anything in this like burgundy color. Can you guys see the? Oh, I guess you can't really see it on that. Well, on that computer screen you can see it, but anything that's like in this berry color is where the inputs are. Anything in black, don't you're not supposed to touch because it is uh, a formula, and you'll break the formula if you touch it. So, uh, yeah, and then so the. You're, we start by putting in, you know, the name, we put in a photo, because once you look at enough deals, you will definitely forget which one you're talking about. I know that happens to me, it probably yeah. happens to you. Uh, it's, we call it deal merge. I can't remember my password. So. And they're all the same. So it's really weird. <laughs> um, okay, so we put in the address, we like to know kind of where we're looking. This is a total made up deal. This is not a real deal at all. So you'll want to use real numbers. So when, okay, let's go back to like the basics of what we need to even get to this point, right? So to look at any multifamily, you're going to want to have what's called a T12 or a rent and a rent roll, both, you need both. Um, the T12 is essentially a profit and loss. Yeah. It's the trailing 12 months. So it's the most recent 12 months. So every month that passes, the furthest month out drops off the T12. So if we we're going to get a most recent T12 today, today, September 23rd, we would get it going uh, August to August, not, or right. well, actually, yeah, September August. to August, September to August, September 2021 to August 2022 would be a complete T12. So the last 12 months. And then next month, it'll be October to September. So it keeps revolving and add, you add one month and drop off the oldest month. Uh, so you're going to first Probably. start. So far? Okay. Yeah. And stop me if there's like any questions or anything like that. Uh, so first we're gonna enter our address, we're gonna enter how many units, we're gonna enter the year of construction, what class the asset is. Um, we're gonna enter what the, bless you, bless you. Um, what the whisper price is. So this is, what is the broker telling you they want you to pay for it or that the seller will absolutely not sell it for less than this number. Um, and then you wanna put in what you wanna offer. And this is gonna be really dependent on the market, the competition, um, you know, two years ago, even, eight months ago, six months ago, if you were being told like a $40 million whisper, it, it could have gone for like 40, yeah, 45. I lost a deal. I think we had offered 109 million for it. Do you know where I traded? Yes. $120 million. So there are- Now, when you see that, that you go, that um, no way. I can't. Yeah. I can't. I mean, I could if I wanted to lose investor money. So I guess it depends if you want to lose your investor's money or not. <laughs> um, no, it, it really what it matters is your investor's appetite for risk and what they need for returns. Because 
I need very high returns in order to invest into projects like this because my opportunity cost is very high. I can invest into our own deals or something else that's going to make me more money. So I need a much higher return than a high income earner that maybe needs like seven to 15% of annualized return. Um, so it depends on who your investors are. So whoever was competing against me, their return requirements yeah. were just lower so that they could be more efficient with their capital. Uh, and the reason she said that, because if she's going to pay out a 10, 12 percent return to her investors, she's got to have a higher return on top of to be able to do that. And exactly. And administrative costs and still make money for it. Exactly. Investors. Yeah. So these will auto calculate your price per door and your offer price per door. Um, and we're going to just leave everything here. This is all in black. We're going to just leave this for now because we'll come back to it and visit it. But this is where we're going to look at, okay, what's happening on the deal itself. Um, so in this example, we're assuming a $40 million asset, 200 units, built in 2000 in Orlando. I want y'all to pay attention to the entry cap rate. Oh, yes. That, that they're asking. And we'll we'll get back to this here in class. We'll We'll, get to we'll come back to why we care about this. First, I'm going to show you guys how to put the inputs into this, and then we'll go back and we'll disseminate exactly what it means and how to look at it. Um, a capital improvement. So this is going to be how much you need to renovate. So in this example, we're saying we need to do 100 of the units. We need to put in $8,000 a door to 100 of the units. Maybe it's more. Maybe in this example, we'll start off by saying we need to do maybe 200 units, right? Oh, what did I do? You did. Why don't you guys believe in Max? Always making me use these non-Apple computers. Life is so hard. Um, First world problem. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> seriously. Um, then these here are going to be input. So how much do you need in your operating account? Maybe you feel more comfortable with 2%. Maybe you're fine with 1%. Maybe you just want to see what it looks like if you bring 2%. Um, acquisition fee, you know, 2%, closing costs. This is going to be your title, your transfer taxes, your lender fees, all of that, whatever it costs you to close on your settlement statement. Uh, roughly 2% is mostly mm -hmm. accurate maybe it's going to be like two and a half maybe it's going to be one and a half so you'll and want to yeah depending on the size of the deal and you're also going to want to update this this is a living document this isn't something that is like okay i, I underwrote it on the back of the envelope and i'm done you're going to as you get better information you're going to want to keep updating it and changing it to see where your numbers end up um financing fees this is like if you are raising investor capital and you're charging them a financing fee for guaranteeing the debt or putting your name on the debt or finding the debt and getting the loan, um, that's a fee for a sponsor usually. And you can make that 1%, 2%, 8%, whatever you want there. So again, these are all numbers that are inputs for you. And on the size of a deal like this, 2% is, is 2, 3% is par for the course. Yeah, I, I'd say... One to 4% is probably pretty standard, depending on the size of the deal, depending on the numbers of the deal. Now, you may come into a situation where the deal just doesn't work if right. you charge 2%. So maybe you leave some of it in there and you take it on the back end if you overperform, or maybe you just charge half a percent or you waive it. So there's a lot of oh, complex yeah. structures right. we can get into there, but I'll spare you guys that right now. So... <laughs> Um, LTV, this is what the leverage you're going to get is. So how much is your bank debt going to be? Uh, this is usually going to be a guess out of the gate. And then after you get bank terms, like your debt terms, you can start updating this. We increased the interest rate yes, because yes. the Fed just increased the interest rate like two days ago. Uh, we amortized over 30 years, 10-year loan terms. I put in JLL. That's our preferred lender. So that's who we use. Um, and then this is going to be your preferred return. Um, so this is going to be the first 100% of profit goes to your investor or your LP until they realize your their preferred return. So let's say you invested $100,000. Yeah. Until you get $6,000 back, I don't get anything as the sponsor of the deal. Why is this important when you're raising capital? Because your investors want to know that you're aligned with their incentives as well. That you're going to make sure they get paid. Correct. So it protects <laughs> them from downside risk while allowing you to share in the upside risk. Right. Uh, or sorry, upside potential, oh. not upside risk. <laughs> um, and so then you can have the LP split afterward. I would say on average, this is usually going to be 70-30. And basically what that means is after 
the investor hits their return, 6%, 10%, whatever you put there, then the split is 70% to the limited partners investor, 30% yeah. to the GP. Yeah. So um, that's a stand, fairly standard, but again, I'll show you guys how you can look at it in different ways. You can make decisions about whether um, it's the right split or the right setup for you. Then we're going to come up, let's go down to the unit mix next. So we're going to go down to the unit mix and we're going to put in here all of the different floor plans. So if there's five floor plans, you're going to put all of those in. If there's three, two, whatever it is, and then you're going to put how many units are in each floor plan. And then we're going to put in what are the current rents? So what are they getting on these units on average? And we'll find that on the rent roll. Right. Um, and then we're going to look at it and we're going to say, listen, this is way under market. So actually we can get 1425 on unit 1A or 1550 unit one or B1. So I'm, you know, I'm making these up because this isn't a real asset, but we would look to what the market is well, doing. Yeah, we're looking at comps. Yeah, so we're looking at comps. Idea. We're kind of understanding like, okay, this is where we think you can go. Brokers will be a great source of information for you here. Um, and then you can always have like CoStar, Axiometrics. Right. Some of those will give you some good ideas of what market rents are. Um, and then we're, and oh, it'll spit out this really pretty graph. Which will show you what the breakdown is. So this tells me that I have the most number of B1 types. Um, this is my C1, this is my A1. It, it's just a visualization. It doesn't really do anything. It looks pretty and I like to see it in a visual representation because I like to see as few one bedroom, one bathrooms as possible. Yeah. So if this was my one bedroom, one bathroom, I'd be like, oh, that might be just too much representation there. But um, then what we're going to do is we're going to come here. Um, I'm going to actually take these down so that I can show you how we manipulate these afterward. Not manipulate. Manipulate the numbers. Yeah, uh, yeah not, <laughs> not artificially inflate, <laughs> manipulate in the sense of input differently right. or make different assumptions. Um, so this is going to be your other income, right? So this is what does... What does your year one of other income creation look like on an existing asset or amenities you're going to charge for? So the first one I like to consider is, can we charge an amenity fee? What is that? I'm doing amenity fee. So the amenity fee, this was new to me. Is I it? didn't, well, I know what it is, but you, I didn't know people would pay it. And so she adds an amenity fee to take care of the pool, the landscape and the parking lots, whatever. Yep. To minimize all the other the expense expenses. Yep. And so she's putting 10 to 20 bucks a door on that. And I want you to see the equity creation from just $10 a month. Across on all the units. units. Right. Assuming this cap rate. $24,000 a year, $632,000. That's from $10. They say so, the easiest way to make more money is just charge more for what you already do. <laughs> is that what they say? Yeah. Who says this? Everybody. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm with it, but um, so that actually we don't even need this, this new business plan, just charge more. <laughs> that's right. Just charge more. <laughs> uh, and that's essentially what this is, right? Like this is a business plan to see where you can charge more, um, what you can actually do on the asset, where you can save money. And I'll show you where those inputs go here in a second. Um, now on parking, let's say we do reserved parking uncovered. Yeah, maybe we can get 20 bucks a month on a hundred spots. Maybe not. Maybe we think we can only get 50 spots. Whatever you think is reasonable, you want to input those numbers there. Washer and dryers, let's assume there's hookups in every unit. We're going to charge, let's say $45 to rent washers and dryers from us. And then valet trash, 200 units at $25. So now we've put all of our inputs in here and we look at this and we're like, oh gosh, this deal. Is... Hold, on, hold on, go back, go back to that segment. This one? Yes, the uh, other income. Look at the $200,000 a year in additional income just from taking an asset that was didn't have those things there. You're going to do a little upgrade to it. And after you upgrade it, you're going to add 200000 a year just because now you're going to repop, it may take a repopulation of the asset to, to, to do that but probably not in this market yeah a turn on the is... tenants yeah so you can't just go in the middle of someone's lease and be like oh by the way now you're gonna have like 75 dollars worth of new charges so you have you do have to wait until the lease expires um and you're renewing the lease or getting a new tenant in to start adding these but generally a lease is going to be about a year so within the course of the first 12 months you should be able to turn 100 percent of the units um either through lease renewals or through new tenants coming into the door right. And actually, this is one of my, I'm going to 
add a secret. A Another secret cheat sauce. code? Yes, a uh -oh. cheat code. Now, okay. when, when Venus says it's a cheat code, somebody that has uh, transacted on more than 900 million. No, not 900, 800. Oh, oh okay. The difference. <laughs> He's lying. He's lying to you guys. 800, 900, a billy, you know. No, not yet. Okay. Because that's like a milestone. We have to wait for it. Right? You have to like work to it. that. Yeah, right. I thought it was going to be this year, but it is not looking okay. good. So next year, this well, year or next year. I don't know. We'll see. I'm trying this year. Still. That's what I'm saying. The year is not done, but I don't know. It's tough out there. Um, <laughs> so it is. I can't it is tough out there. Yeah. Every single deal. Um, okay, so pest control. Okay, so everybody's like, okay, obviously pest control. We probably already have it on a 200 unit building. But if you look at the price on pest control, right? Most of these units are paying like three, maybe $4. What happens if we just add an additional $2 a month to pest control? Do you think tenants are gonna be like, oh, there's no way I'm paying $2 a month more. I am going to pack up my stuff and move out. No, they're probably gonna be like, okay, $2 doesn't make a huge difference. But to us, look at what it does. It adds $126,000. So in another way to say this is every dollar of income you add to this property, you're adding $63,000 in value. In addition to your cash flow of $2,400 best per year. So I just want to point that out because that's like a big... Um, that's like a big value add that people don't realize how big of an impact. But when we're buying things at such low cap rates, every dollar makes like a massive difference in what it adds we're to the four property. Bucks you want to, oh, you want to add $4? Right. Now you're being greedy. <laughs> so, okay. Now, if we were to just look at it like this, we'd be like, oh, this is like not really good. It's not a good deal. Um, but what we're going to do before we do that. Okay. What math? The Excel does it for you. Bless you. That's about right. Yeah, I know. It's Excel. <laughs> no. It knows how to do math. <laughs> well, I had to get it. I had to picture it. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so here what we're going to fill out. We're going to start here at the top, <laughs> yeah. and we're going to do our annual revenue increase. So we're going to be really conservative on this. Um, we're going to say we're going to say that we're increasing the revenue 2% year over year. That's not where we are in today's market, but you can't underwrite to like an 18, 20% increase because that's just way too aggressive. So like, I would say three to 4% is probably pretty conservative, um, but let's be ultra conservative just to start out the underwriting yeah, yeah. and let's do 2%. Um, and then we're going to assume our expenses are going to go up, right? We all know the cost of everything's going up. We're hearing about inflation. We're reading about it. We're paying like I don't know how much a tomato costs, but I was going to use that as an example, but then I realized I don't know how much a tomato actually costs. So that was bad. Like, about, we're now paying $2 uh, for a tomato, but I don't know if that's how much people pay for tomatoes. I don't either. I don't grocery shop, so I don't know. It's um, funny. I looked in the grocery, I looked in the refrigerator last night and realized that I was drinking my last bottle of water. I had absolutely nothing in the refrigerator. Oh, you should Instacart. I have not been to the most in years. Yeah. It's a hard time. Yeah. I oh, good. I'm about to check it out. It might be nice I'm going to I'm gonna refer you to it so you can give me $10. Okay. So, yes. Woohoo. I'm rich. Okay. So now what we're. <laughs> I'm learning so much. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> You're learning. My password. Last pass. Is, and you can put your. Instacart password and last pass, it's going to be life changing for you. I, am. I know, right? <laughs> I really am. Exactly. I feel like your face is like off the screen. Okay. So now this is where we do our inputs. So remember how I said we need our T12 up front? This is where we're going to use it. So we're going to take our T12 numbers and we're going to input them here. You're not going to put this. This is a formula. It'll come from the dashboard when you invent in enter your um your market rents. rents. Yeah, your market rents, your unit breakdown that we did on the other sheet. Um, this is going to be the vacancy loss or the vacancy rate. That's going to also auto calculate based on what you put in here. 
these are all inputs. And when you guys get this, um, I tried to put like a note in here of what you should be in entering here. You're basically going to be taking it from their T12. And this is easy. This is just copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. It'll give you what your gross income is. This is your gross rental or gross potential rent. Um, and this is going to be your gross income or gross revenue. Yeah. And and any deal that you look at, uh, you will have a 12-month a financial statement. It might be on the back of a napkin, depending on the size of the deal or the owner or their management company. Yeah. Uh, but they have a bank account where they've deposited money and, and they have one money. that they've taken money out. And they have taxes that they've filed That's with, correct. which have it. So it's weird because some sellers, especially if they don't have like professional books, they'll be like, oh, I'm not going to send you my tax returns. And I'm like, you're not going to send me the tax return that you sent to the IRS? Like, who am I? Yeah, what am I going to do? You already sent it to the IRS. This is weird. It's a weird hill to die on. But a lot of people get nervous about that. So sometimes they'll require you to be under contract or an LOI phase or due diligence or early access agreement in order to get access to that. Yeah. I highly, highly recommend if you're just starting off not to take on a deal that has messy financials because... <laughs> You just don't know what you don't know yet. You haven't looked at enough deals to know, okay, is $200 pay, uh, per unit on payroll way too little? Right. You just don't know that. But like, we know that that's completely wrong and they either miss something or they're lying or they're not running it efficiently. So we know to be like, okay, wait, something weird is going on here and it's going to like send up big flags for us. But if you're just starting, you just don't know yet. My other <coughs> piece of advice to you guys is as you're starting out, you can go to LoopNet and you can download like hundreds of projects with T12s and rent rolls. And you can just look at them. You can just practice looking at them and underwriting all day long. What will happen is eventually you're going to start seeing patterns emerging and you're going to start being able to say, wait, that's too low payroll. That doesn't make sense here. Um, so like here, I can see this at $1,200 per unit. I know that that is probably way too low for where we are in the market. Two years ago, yeah, sure, $1,200 maybe. But in our markets, I know that we can't do that today. Um, that means you're paying, having to pay more for, for staff, right? Yeah. So, because think about it, how much has employment wages gone up in the last six, eight, 12 months, right? A lot of companies are saying they can't find labor. Mm -hmm. And like I know some of our companies that my family owns, we pay like $20, $25 an hour and we still can't find labor. And it's, it's, not we don't require college educations right. so there's theoretically be a lot of people but sometimes it's really hard for us to find people um and we're i heard that yesterday from the management company i told them that's not my problem it is but it problem. is <laughs> no. uh, <laughs> well, you know it's interesting because it i don't think it's an issue like a lot of people will say and this is totally a tangent so sorry uh but a lot of people are saying like oh well companies just don't want to pay employees what they're worth but i don't think that that's true at least not it's in not our companies right like we're consistently voted the best company to work for in the area we're consistently voted like number one in a lot of areas and then we pay well above the minimum wage and these are people that aren't necessarily going after white collar jobs but they want jobs that are more flexible we give them weekends and holidays off like it's a pretty good deal and uh we still have trouble finding employees that's that once they come they stay mm -hmm. but to even get them through the door is really tough a lot of them don't show up for interviews so that i say this because it's an issue for us on the apartment side because if we can't get leasing agents we can't get maintenance staff then what what happens we have to pay more to be more competitive right. And we have to anticipate a lot more turnover. So um, we want to make sure we take that into account here on our T12. Yeah, and on a smaller deal, you wind up being the leasing agent and the management if you can't. No, 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 no. Well, I'm, Never. I'm... <laughs> no. <laughs> but yes, someone yeah. might. Not me. Yes, the general you, not yeah. the you or you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to go through their expenses on their T12. You're going to fill all of these in to exactly what they have. And then what we're going to do, and actually what I should do here, these should all be in black because they're not inputs. I just remember I copied it from the column over. 
Okay. Um, so now what we're going to do is we want to go to what's called our pro forma. So pro forma is essentially what do we think we can do on the asset? Where do we think we can operate it? Right. So we already put in what we are going to move our rents to, right? So that's going to pull here automatically. That comes from the dashboard. Yep. Then we're going to look at the vacancy. Where do we think we're going to be occupied? Like 92, 95% is probably a pretty standard guess. So mm -hmm. let's say we're only going to have 5% vacancy here. Okay, so we're going to put in 5%. Our loss to lease. This is how much do we think that we're going to be able to decrease? Does everyone know what loss to lease is? Should no, we go back. Go back to our uh, yeah. dashboard. Okay. Do you want to define loss to lease? So the loss to lease here is the difference between what the current rents are and what our market rents are. Here is this 1425 is what the market rents are. And here's the current rents that the property is receiving. So that leaves a $268 per month loss to lease. With that, as Venus said, we can't just come in and say, hey, your new rent's 1425. <laughs> you got to pay up. No, you will have new units as the leases wear off coming into this new rent. So that loss to lease amount will actually go down every month. But if you're continually raising rents, then you're going to have a new loss to lease created. Correct. So, so it's just a revolving. Yeah, we take into account increasing loss to lease here. You could theoretically take into account a decreasing or burned off loss to lease. That would be totally legitimate if your plan is to go in, renovate all the units, bring them all to market, and then in years three, four, and five to operate it with zero loss to lease. So just note, you can actually manipulate these to change these uh, to make this zero if you wanted. And that would be a very reasonable assumption to make depending on what your business plan is. Yeah. Um, in this case, I assumed in the first month, we're just going to burn down 25% of their loss to lease. So what I did was I took the T12 and then multiplied it by 75% to get our assumption here. Again, remember, this is supposed to be like a quick back of the envelope number. I assume that we're going to have um, $2,000 in concessions. We aren't really using concessions today, so we don't necessarily need to worry about having concessions. And the concession would be a $50 per month uh, move-in special. Yeah. And so that concession would over... Yeah, it can be anything, right? It can yeah. be like $100 Amazon gift card, first yeah. month's free rent, whatever that is, you can put it in here. Um, units, we are assuming we're going to have one model unit and we're going to assume that the rent loss on that is $1,500 a month um, times your 12 months. Bad debt, we're going to assume that, okay, they only had 1262 in bad debt. We're going to assume that maybe it goes up a little bit to 1.3. Let's say we know something about this area specifically. We can change that number to make it higher or lower. The idea here is you want to take a very reasonable but very quick first guess at how you're going to operate the asset and what you can do there. So payroll, remember how I said we knew immediately that 1200 is yeah. not enough, right? So let's increase that and let's increase it by 20%. 1440, I think it's probably more reasonable, probably a little bit slim. Yeah. yeah, probably are closer to 15, 15. 25, 15, 50. And what that represents really, again, is the salaries. Yeah. What is your manager going to make? What's your maintenance guy's going to make? Benefits. Benefits. Maintenance gals. Okay. So. Funny how she here is it just from from, from the dashboard. To all the way to the dashboard. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a thousand units? Do you want to sell them? Do. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a thousand units and you want to sell them? Uh, yeah, so you can use this for any number of units to adjust it. You'll just adjust it on the dashboard here. And when you say payroll, this is what here. Have this is annual. So the T12 is the last 12 months. Oh, that's per door, per door. annual okay. per door. So um, I we added this actually when we were going through this yes, the first we time we added the per door on the T12 and per door on the pro forma, because there are going to be some numbers that are going to just jump out to you more on a per door basis. So Alvin had a really good idea to add it in here. So we did. Um, so then your maintenance and repairs, you're, you see here. I took it up by 15% from where the current owner has it. Probably pretty reasonable given the cost of rising supplies and labor and maintenance costs. Um, and you can see, go back up in, and you can see in the formula bar that yeah. all she did was take the existing number yeah, from the previous owner and just add it. 
by 15%. Now you can also just say, uh, I don't want to do it that way. I want to just assume $90,000 and you can, and you can put 90K in there if you want. Which is what you did on the next one. Yeah. So on contract services, I said, okay, you know, maybe we have a thousand units in the area and I know our landscaper really wants our business and they're going to give me a discount on this. So I know I can get lower landscaping costs than what the current owner has. So I think I can save $3,000 on contract services. Then I'm going to put that assumption in there. I'm not going to just use the seller's assumption. I'm going to use what I actually think we can do. Um, same with like the turn and make ready. This might be too low. It might be too high. I increased it by 10%. Maybe you look at it and you say, no, it really has to go up by 15%, right? Whatever that is, we'll change it. Um, same with advertising. All of these are going to be the same. Now, one thing is management fee. So when I look at this, they have a 3% management fee. Maybe I'm managing it in-house and my property management is only going to charge me 2.5%. Then I'm going to change it to whatever that number is. Okay, the two biggest mistakes. Yeah, we talked about We talked that. about this. Taxes and insurance, right? So you are going in and you're increasing the value of the property. Your taxes are going to go up. You are theoretically buying the property for more than the seller bought it for. Right. Your taxes are going to step up in basis. Do not take this number and be like, okay, the seller. Oh, I can eight. lower it. Yeah, or <laughs> I'm I can take money. You might be able to save money from the assessed value by using tax consultants. Uh, do you use tax consultants? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, we do too. Yeah. I want to know who you use. You Meritex. Do. Okay, I don't know who that is. Um, okay, we can talk about it later. But Meritex. Yeah, I want to know who you use because yeah. we use a They're consultant really that's... Are they consultants? Yes. Okay. Um, so you can use a consultant. You can lower this in some cases. You'll want to know what the millage rate is in your area, but you'll really want to dive deeper into this. Um, and then insurance. Well, you just said one that the mill rate for taxes. Said. Oh, yeah. Do you want to explain it? Well, each county or city all has a per. So if your house is valued or assessed at $1,000, each taxing authority, college, school, um, city, county. city, county, all of those have a percentage of, of that dollar that they charge you in taxes. It could be zero, it's point zero 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 something. And then you get to the mill rate when it all adds up to, I think Frisco is what, 3.2 now, something like that? Um, I don't know. I think so. I have no idea. So Larry knows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, when you look at your property tax bill, it'll have it on there. It, yeah. it, it'll, and the, have... the millage rate will be a percentage of that amount. Yeah. So it might be like 85% of the amount, and that would equate to 3.2% of the total amount. So. And that depends too in the states where you have property uh, high Correct. personal state income tax. Yes. They have lower property tax property usually. Tax. And also it will depend on whether you're in a disclosure state or non-disclosure state, because if you're in a disclosure state, they know what you paid for the property. If you're in a non-disclosure state, they don't know. So they're going to send an appraiser out to appraise it. And you can fight the appraisal value because you're not disclosing, which is also why it's important to not disclose what you paid for a property on social media. I know it's like really exciting to talk about like, oh, I paid a hundred million for this. But you'll see, like, I am so vague about how much we've paid for properties today. This is something I learned after many years. I wish I would have known it years ago. Um, but it's something I learned after many years. So now I'm like, yeah, we paid nine figures or we paid eight figures or over this amount. And I'll be like very vague. I won't really say the property name. It's because we want to make sure we're maximizing tax benefit. Yeah. Um, so, and also if you're doing value add, they're theoretically, it, you might overpay for the future value you're going to add. So it may be, it should be proper to decrease the taxable um, cost but that's a whole different story. This is boring. Um, the, no, we got well, finance people in here. I yeah, they, I'm a finance person. I don't even care about taxes <laughs> like that. I just care how does it affect my bottom right. line, right? No one else. You don't want to like sit here talking that in depth. Larry's not here. That's great. And I, so, I will be so lost anyway. Yeah, me too. Um, it's outside of my scope of expertise. Yeah. Um, okay, insurance is another one that people are like, oh, I can get this for super cheap. I can get it for like $200 a door. Yeah, five years ago, 
today you're not getting it for that cheap i'd say actually this is probably pretty no i actually think it's like maybe a little bit low well yeah because i'm thinking of for coastal. year one yeah coastal oh wait this is in orlando so we maybe do 800 assume it's more you want to go up all yeah. right let's go up uh, oh. oh, I was going to say the problem. Right. Yes, flood insurance is going to change this. Let's do 740. That's I think fine. that's fairly reasonable. Um, then you can you can charge an asset management fee. So this yeah. is not a property management fee. This is what you as a sponsor can take. Um, and then other expenses, it's going to be like anything that is weird or like doesn't show up or if they have like security or something like that or some kind of nuance you need to add in here or think about you can put it in there um so now what we get to is the expense ratio right they're running at a 44.7 percent expense ratio we're thinking we're gonna have to run at a 43.7 expense ratio and the way we lowered that was by raising the really the raising the income we didn't really lower that many expenses we didn't right we um, actually went up on most of them yeah we went up on most of them you know, they probably are going to go up yeah and the DSCR, which is the debt service coverage ratio, is only 1.3. That means that the lender is unlikely to give us this much leverage on the asset. Uh, but here's what we care about. So now after we do all of these inputs, we can see all these numbers. But actually, I like to come back to the dashboard first. And I can look at this and I can say, oh, we're going to generate less than a 1% IRR. This deal isn't even close to what we would pay for or what we would do here. But let's say that we're going to instead offer 38 million. Let's see. Okay, that takes us to 2%. So we can't even pay 38 million for this asset. But over here, let's say we looked at this and we found out that all of our comps are charging $25 for parking. And let's say they're all charging $65 for washers and dryers. And we already put in $4 for pest control. So now we get more of a mini, mini fee. We're gonna plant some tulips. Okay, yeah, maybe we're gonna do that. Maybe we're gonna get $15, yeah. right? So now you see how this is changing the numbers here. But then maybe we say, oh, guess what? The lender's actually gonna give us 68% in leverage. And the interest rate's actually only six point, let's just say six percent. Oh, not sixty percent. That would not be good. Um, and and the reason that matters on the LTV is because she can go up and get more debt cheaper than she can get more less cheaper than she can get the equity yeah so because she's getting more debt leverage then the payout to the investors is a little bit less so that can increase the cash flow and let's say we say you know what we're going to waive our fees because we really love this area we want this asset we want it in our portfolio We'll see, as I'm moving these numbers, you can see where my IRR is going. So it's not artificially inflating numbers. It's looking at the deal in a different way or increasing the inputs or decreasing the inputs as you get better information. Uh, so let's say we look at pro forma. We go to property management. They say, listen, we have so many units with you. We're going to charge you 2%. Awesome. I'm going to update that. Then let's say on utilities, we find out that, you know what, they have um, they have a 10% increase cap on it. So we're going to change it to that. Um, let's say we, so we say, listen, this area is booming. And it's interesting that we chose Orlando in this example, because Orlando, it, it is, but they just released a measure that they're trying to pass that's rent control for apartments. So oh, really? yes, yeah, so you want to stay like on top of what's going on, because that is really going to change things here. But let's assume that we can raise rents by 5%. And let's assume that our operating expenses are really only going to increase 5%. Um, so now what we're looking at is, okay, let's go see what the, okay, so now the IRR is 18.27%. That's huge. That's great for this yes. area. And let's say we're like, you know what? We know we're not going to get it for 38 million. Mm -hmm. We already know that. They told us 40. Let's see what happens if we pay 40 for it now. Oh, not 4 million. You'll get a great return there. Okay. Now you're getting 17.61. Okay, now I know we can compete pretty hard here because when we look at this, I care about this number right here. What are my passive investors getting? As long as my project level is high enough that it is more than what my minimum I need for my LPIRR mm -hmm. is, I have room to play with how much I make in the deal. 
So now let's say I know my investors need a 14% IRR to be interested. Well, now what I can do is I can say, all right, you know what? I'll give them 80% of the deal. Look at that. I get 80%, right? Or giving them 80% gets me well over that. So now when I go out to investors and say, hey, we underwrote the deal, we're only going to give you a 14% IRR. That's all our numbers are projecting. And I'm going to adjust our numbers. This is where I'm going to manipulate the numbers to make my expenses artificially high. I'm going to decrease my income just to get to closer to a 40%. So 14% IRR. So it's okay to decrease your projections when you're showing investors. You don't want to yeah. increase them because then you're going to under promise and over deliver. So maybe it's just here. Okay. So this is where, yeah, this is like a rounding error on deal this size. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, okay, you know, I'm only going to have to get $45 from Washington Dryer. So I'm going to go out to my investors. I'm going to say, hey, here's this deal. Here's what it looks like. Here is, um, here's the IRR. Now, one thing you want to be mindful of is, okay, what about the year one cash on cash? It's pretty low. You're not mm -hmm. going to hit prep. And let's say you as a sponsor want to see how much you're going to make on the deal. Notice here, you're going to have zeros throughout the whole period because there's not enough cash flow on the deal to meet the 6% prep. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind on this. So that means you could literally own a 200 unit asset and make nothing. Until the end. Until the end. And then you can maybe make something. But the thing to know about this, um, limitations of the spreadsheet, if you will, are <laughs> um, the mortgage or debt service on here. This takes into account P&I payments. Um, a lot of times we'll get interest only payments. So you can change this to calculate for interest only payments um, with a balloon note here in this year or wherever three or four year. Um, so just notice that. And then you'll you can talk to investors and say, okay, listen, there's not a lot of cash flow on this, but we're doing this really because the IRR is so phenomenal that on the exit, you're gonna get a pretty solid return. It's still worth doing the project without the IRR, without the uh, cash flow during the whole period. So all this is, is it's a tool for you to decide one, if you want to want to investigate it further Two, if you are going to investigate it further, you'll have an idea of what you can offer. And three, it gives you some speaking points that you can look into further with brokers, comps, data sets. And then you can also find out from brokers like, Hey, I'm looking at this, but in order for me to really have my investors come in, I can't pay 40 million I'm going to offer 38 million and here's why. Well, a broker might look at them and say, okay, that's reasonable. That's I understand that. Um, so it's about that. And then the other thing I want to really make sure we point out is here. Um, this is the exit cap rate. This is a formula, so don't break it, but it's showing a 10 basis point per planned year of hold increase. So we plan for five years of hold. So it's a 50 basis point increase on cap rate. Um, if you want to be more conservative, you can go to like one, a full basis points or a full point, a hundred basis points increase. So 4.09%, we can assume a 5.09%. It's going to drop your project level IRR pretty significantly. Um, but I'd say seven to 10 basis points per planned year of hold of increase is a fairly conservative assumption to be making. So that is how we That's use awesome. this. And then you can see the you, exit. Yeah. Where were you? I said no. Yeah, I said no because yesterday when we underwrote it, we were making up numbers then and yeah. it did not work. So I was like, all right, this is a no. But now that we're looking at this, this is a solid yes. So what do you have to do for, uh, is it from the team or? It depends on your investors, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have an investor that says, hey, I don't really care about any cash and cash. I only want to hit a 12% IRR. And as long as you can get me that, I'm good. You might have investors like me, who are like, no, I need a much higher IRR unless it's our own project to hit that. Um, so it's really a way to look at opportunity cost for investors. So it depends what your investor base is. So you want to be talking to them before you have your deal on the table. So you understand what their buy box is. You know, I was... You said how they have a 14% and what's your projection. So what if they change after you go on well, you would hope that it would change to go up because she decreased all of her assumptions. Uh -huh. So then what yeah. that does is it increases. You always want to err on the side of being more conservative, right? So no matter what this number is that you you show to investors, because you were theoretically conservative, you should be showing higher projections and better numbers on your internal underwriting. 
And so, and this is not a full complete underwriting analysis. This is just like an initial pass. Um, you'll want to do a more in-depth analysis after you decide to go forward on a project. Exactly. Right. Right. Exactly. And then the more diligence you do, because this is just, hey, talking about it, send me your numbers and look at it. Yeah. If you like it, then you go out and do an inspection. And it, like Ariel said, it applies to a two unit. Exactly. Four unit, doesn't matter. Just if you know what your numbers are. Yes. And where you need to invest so, with it. Okay, it's weird having us on the screen. Right? I'm not so, going to hit any. Okay. Bye, y'all. Thanks.